Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to participate in this uh, meeting. I, I think it's I think it's terrific that there's so many people here on a Sunday morning thinking about <laughs> emphysema. God, it's a uh, it's a pleasure to be here for sure. Um, I, I have a very simple view of this uh, problem of uh, interventions for emphysema, and we've heard several of these options, uh, surgical LVRS, valves. There was some enthusiasm for airway bypass uh, procedure, and I think that's uh, kind of an experimental thing and has not yet reached cruising altitude. And then, of course, there's the transplant option. And this is, a, once again, I'm a surgeon, not someone as intellectual as Mike, and, and so this is our algorithm that's about 20 years old now or more. Uh, so we do uh, the same as you. We do have a multidisciplinary group that evaluates these patients, uh, patients who have uh, severe hyperinflation and uh, low FEV1 and poor exercise uh, tolerance. Um, we tend to offer those patients transplant, although, as I'll show you shortly, a uh, transplant has become a less uh, practical option for patients with uh, emphysema, at least in the U.S. So uh, these patients uh, are, I think, more often uh, uh, those who certainly have heterogeneous disease and some target areas, uh, better exercise tolerance. They, they are referred for volume reduction strategy, and our bias uh, is to offer a, a, a surgical option, and we do all of those operations video at this at this time. It's interesting to reflect on the first human lung transplant that was performed brings out a number of interesting interesting aspects. So this is a procedure that Dr. James Hardy performed uh, in 1963 and, and the, it, the, the lung donor was a non-heart beating donor that died of a myocardial infarction so the patient was dead. There wasn't no definition of brain death at that time. Uh, but the recipient was a patient who had COPD and a left uh, hyalur bronchogenic carcinoma, and he would, had been judged inoperable. It was also uh, interesting to reflect that the recipient was a, a prisoner, uh, so it's, uh, possibly there might have been some skipping some of the details on informed consent, but in any case, uh, that uh, patient did not survive very long, uh, but it did uh, demonstrate that uh, a human lung allograft could function for a period of time, and. Several years later, it's interesting quote from David Bates in the New England Journal, any physician who has a sad task of caring for a patient suffering from advanced pulmonary emphysema must on occasion wish that human lung transplantation could offer some hope to these unfortunate patients. And it, it's interesting that it was about 15 or uh, so years after this that transplant became much more widely used for patients with emphysema. Now these days we do most of these operations through anterolateral thoracotomies and in emphysema patients because the chest is so expanded and there's very seldom um, adhesions uh, present, uh, we can conduct those operations through separate anterolateral uh, incisions. And this uh, shows uh, uh, a typical result from a uh, right single lung transplant for emphysema. This is a patient that was uh, transplanted uh, uh, years ago you know, for a time in the early 80s, uh, as we were developing lung transplantation, it was thought that single lung transplant for emphysema was impossible because it would induce a significant ventilation perfusion mismatch. And it was uh, not until 1989 that Andrew Asson and the group from Paris reported a successful experience with the application of a single lung transplant for patients with emphysema. And subsequently, uh, single lung transplant became a much more common operation for these patients with uh, emphysema. And it's actually the radiographic imaging from this particular patient that made us think back in the early 90s that maybe some of the beneficial effect from a uh, lung transplant in an emphysema patient was some restoration of normal chest contour. You can see in this patient how flattened the diaphragms and how inflated the chest is on a post-op x-ray with a single lung graft in there, the, the diaphragms are much higher and no doubt functioning at a better level. So it's, it's interesting to reflect a little bit on the history of uh, the development of LVRS and transplantation. It kind of went hand in hand. 
And this is the typical result we'd obtain from a patient who has a bilateral transplant uh, for emphysema, a near immediate um, restoration of chest contour and uh, near normal lung function. Now, what I'd like to do is, is there hasn't actually been that much written about transplant for emphysema in recent years. It, this is all literature from some years ago. Um, and it reflects the problems that we're having with the application of lung transplant for emphysema in, in the U.S. But in any case, this is an important paper that was published uh, a decade ago in The Lancet, looking at a uh, group of patients who uh, underwent transplant for emphysema, and you can see the steady rise of uh, uh, bilateral transplant uh, uh, as an option for these patients. And the reason for that is because those patients uh, have uh, better long-term survival. Bilateral provides better functional results just like it does uh, in the uh, lung volume reduction uh, patient. And when they did propensity matching on a portion of that analysis, their that, uh, survival benefit uh, persisted. But here's the problem for the emphysema uh, physicians and transplanters. Uh, it was apparent at that time in the mid-2000s uh, that maybe transplant wasn't so helpful in terms of survival, uh, particularly for patients of older age. And you can see that the, that the survival benefit really disappears in those patients of older age. So I think when we think about lung transplant for emphysema, it's less, it has less to do with survival than it does with uh, quality of life. Well, around about... Um, 1998 in the United States, there was a, a, a law regulation passed by Congress that uh, demanded that organ allocation be, be uh, established on the basis of urgency or likelihood of a recipient dying on the waiting list, that the time on the list was not uh, the preeminent factor because prior to this time, the patients who were on the list the longest time had the uh, uh, highest priority score. So emphysema patients, as long as they were participating in a rehab program and were getting good medical care and they were on supplemental oxygen and doing exercise uh, 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 um, every day, those patients can live for a very long time, unlike cystic fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis patients or those with pulmonary hypertension. So it took about seven years uh, to develop a priority scheme that everybody could agree upon, and in 2005, uh, we implemented a, a lung allocation score, which uh, allocated patients by likelihood of them dying uh, on the waiting list, basically. Now, if a patient had a very high risk of dying uh, in the first year after transplantation, they had a, that would reduce their score somewhat, but the predominant feature was how likely was that patient to die on the waiting list, and that patient uh, had the uh, highest score. And I'll show you the implications of that uh, subsequently. Uh, meanwhile, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation had matured significantly and continues to do so. Um, you're all familiar with these regular reports that are put out by the ISHLT uh, on the annual registry data. Now, bear in mind that this is a voluntary international registry, but still most busy programs do submit their data to the ISHLT, and in the, in the United States, it's a mandatory uh, uh, submission uh, to this registry. And you can see how these, uh, uh, these uh, transplant centers are uh, allocated, uh, European, North American, and other. So the majority of busy programs are in Europe or in North America. And interestingly, I don't know if that yellow line shows, it was not too bad. Uh, that just demonstrates retransplantation, and I'll have a few remarks to say about that, but it's obvious that retransplants represent a very small percentage of the transplant procedures done internationally uh, at the present time. Uh, this uh, is an interesting slide because it, it depicts the, how busy these centers are. And uh, you can see on the far right, there's uh, a very small number of transplant centers in the U.S. and Europe performing more than 50 transplants a year. And yet those centers comprise uh, 
uh, about a third of all transplants done internationally. So the, the, these centers are busy. They're doing lots of, uh, lots of cases, whereas to, it would, astonishes me that there's a number of uh, small transplant programs doing less than five cases a year. I just don't know how that's practical or beneficial to the center or to the patients. In any case, uh, this now will demonstrate, I think, a little bit uh, the implications of the lung allocation score. So the yellow uh, bar that begins to widen in the mid-2000s is pulmonary fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis in the darker yellow really uh, hasn't changed much, remains relatively constant, but there's been a definite decrease in the number of uh, patients uh, with uh, emphysema who are being uh, transplanted. And now, I don't think that that uh, allocation has the same impact uh, uh, in other countries as it does in the U.S., but it, it definitely has a big impact uh, for us. As in our, our experience and others uh, around the world, that this is the international experience, the better survival with bilateral lung transplant. There is, a, it's a complicated slide, but the gist of it is the survival uh, is getting better uh, uh, over time in various cohorts divided by decade. Uh, and uh, at the bottom, you can see the rather dismal results for retransplantation, although perhaps in recent years they've improved slightly. Uh, just a word or two about pediatric lung transplants. Um, if we characterize pediatric patients as being anybody less than 17 or 18, obviously the majority of these patients are patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, very few, uh, interesting though, very few uh, number of uh, infants uh, undergoing lung transplantation for uh, a variety of con interesting conditions, most of them fibrotic. It's also interesting to note that if you look at that group individually, their survival is not greatly different uh, than the uh, adult group uh, overall. The distribution of um, uh, centers, Europe, uh, North America, it's about the same. And once again, we see a very small number of uh, uh, centers. It, it, I, I don't understand exactly how this uh, transpired, but in the late 90s, there were a number of pediatric lung transplant centers that were really quite busy uh, doing more than 20 procedures per year, but now uh, there's very few of those, no center doing that number. Uh, but a reasonable number of uh, uh, centers still active uh, in the pediatric uh, population. And looking at survival, uh, the uh, pediatric patients in that uh, blue uh, graph in the middle, they really have quite respectable survival long-term comparable to the adult population as a whole. And in the retransplant uh, situation, which is a big issue for the pediatric uh, population, it's extraordinarily difficult to deny a child a, a retransplant, uh, and uh, so they do a reasonable number of those in comparison to the number that's done in the adult population. Uh, but still, the, the, the results are, uh, are not very satisfactory. Our own experience uh, at WashU uh, comprised about 1,500 patients uh, as of uh, last fall. And you can see the distribution of those. The vast majority are primary transplants, and uh, the uh, vast majority of those are uh, bilateral procedures. Our annual activity is shown up here. It's gone up a little bit last year. We did 83 transplants last year, which was a record for us. And in our own experience, you'll see a dramatic fall off in the COPD uh, recipients in comparison to the IPF experience, which has really uh, more than doubled in, in the last uh, decade. Also interesting to note, and this is other experience as well, you can see this uh, little uh, graph here on the, uh, on the far right of those with pulmonary hypertension. They really have fallen off substantially, and I think that's just a reflection of far better, far better vasodilator therapy available to these patients. Another interesting problem that uh, transplant programs produce is transplant recipients that need to be looked after. And, uh, you know, at the moment, our program is looking after almost 700 
uh, recipients, which is an uh, entire very big challenge uh, in itself. Our own, our overall survival is shown here, and once again, better uh, survival for patients who have bilateral transplants. And our, our experience is better as time goes by. Each of these curves represents a chronologic series of, of uh, 250 patients, and, and it, it's definitely gotten better. So we, we're getting better uh, as time goes by. And just a word or two about retransplantation. It, it, it represents a very small experience. In our, it's, for us, it's 3%. Internationally, it might be 4 or 5 But those are challenging operations associated with considerable uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, another major issue that uh, troubles transplant programs around the world is uh, suitable donors, availability of su suitable donors. We're lucky in our, uh, our region in that we uh, generate about 30 percent, anywhere from 30 to 35 percent of donors are suitable lung donors. That's far higher than any other center in the United, any other region in the United States. But it's given rise to this uh, business of donation after cardiac death, and you, you're aware of the classification that's been established in our own program, small number of cases because our results have not been very good. We had a higher incidence of primary graft dysfunction, use of ECMO, and uh, perioperative mortality than uh, our experience overall. And there's a whole number of objections to this potential donor source after cardiac death, and I've just listed them here, and the, the ex vivo lung perfusion, which I haven't mentioned, but is a terrific advance, uh, might be able to help sort this out because we have an opportunity to study the lung, perfuse it, correct it, treat it, uh, and then uh, use it. And that strategy has been demonstrated uh, uh, to be quite effective, uh, particularly uh, here in, in Europe and uh, also in, uh, in Toronto. Well, what have we done? But we're far better at patient selection, recipient donor selection. Uh, we're better at donor management. We know how to treat donors prior to transplant much better. Ex vivo perfusion is uh, a big advance. ECMO is transformed. It used to be complicated, and now it's not. Uh, the technique, no doubt, has in evolved. Uh, the more cases they're done, the bigger the program experience, and immunosuppression is much more refined than it was. But what are the opportunities for us? We still are plagued by a lack of suitable donors and a high mortality on the waiting list. Primary graft dysfunction, a problem 20 years ago, is still a problem. Uh, chronic allograft dysfunction or bronchiolitis obliterans is the big problem, and, and we're no, really not much further ahead understanding that problem than we were 20 years ago. Infection malignancy are big issues in the long term, and uh, most importantly, uh, what busy transplant programs need and scholars need is uh, better funding for outstanding research projects. Thank you very much.